This story has it all. Blasphemy, exorcism, family, and the will of God. I hope that you will join us this morning. It is our grace to have you with us in worship. Stay tuned as we learn about being in the family with Jesus. You're not going to want to miss this. Wood. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today. We are so glad that you could be here. Please note that our Wednesday night dinners will start back this Wednesday, the 27th. For a look at the menu and the link to sign up, please refer to Friday's email. Also, please note that preschool registration is currently underway. Registration is now open for current preschool students as well as church members. If you would like more information on registration, please refer to, again, Friday's email, any of our social media pages, or our website. 
Again, thank you so much for joining us for worship today. And kids, stay tuned for the children's message with Miss Marcia and Clay coming up next. And I'll see you next week. Bye. Hey, friends. Hi, friends. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Hi. Clay and I are super excited to see you today. Today we're going to talk to you a little bit about rewards. rewards. Do you have any rewards? Yes. Actually, we do. We have a couple things to show you. This is a first place ribbon that Clay earned a while back. Mm -hmm. And we also have a reward. We have some soccer trophies and some and baseball trophies. Baseball trophies. Do you have any trophies by chance? I bet they do. I bet they do. We sometimes win rewards or trophies and ribbons for winning our tournaments yeah, and playing good in sports and or being first place being first place or being the team player yeah team player um and the opposite of a trophy or a reward is a consequence and i'm going to show you my little friend here was driving a little too fast and the police officer pulled him over and offered him a big fat consequence. He gave him a speeding ticket. A speeding ticket. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Clay and I did a little arts and crafts. Now, in real life, your mommies and daddies may know about speeding tickets, and I hope not, but you see, they're basically consequences for going too fast and breaking the law. And you see, that kind of relates to our story today, because we're gonna talk about a story from Luke chapter. 15 verses 11 through 32. 32, yeah. And it's the story of the prodigal son. And it's about a dad who had two sons. Two sons. One who followed the rules. The rules. That's a good way to put it, actually. And did everything he was supposed to. So he, he was kind to people. He did what his dad asked him to do. He worked in the farm. He did all kinds of things for the family. And the mm -hmm. other son, well, he was also a good son, yeah, but he just asked son. for his money first. And he wanted to spend all his money and all his time and all his energy, he wanted to spend it away from home. He moved, he wasted his money, he celebrated mm -hmm. and had parties and met people and did all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff, bought lots of toys probably, lots, lots of lots video of games. games. Yeah, lots of things. Actually, I don't know that they had video games back then, but I'm sure whatever they had, he bought it. Anyway, he ended up having zero left, not even one penny left. He didn't have any money. He didn't have enough to buy money to eat. So they sent him straight to the pig farm. To the pig's farm. So he ate a lot of mud or slop or something. But anyway, after all that, he decided, I'm starving and I really feel like bad person, a terrible person. So I want to go home and tell my dad I'm sorry. Well, you would think he deserved a very big what? Consequence. Consequence. But in fact, the dad ran all the way to the end of the driveway and opened his arms and welcomed him home and offered him nothing but love. And he also, he didn't stop there. He also had a huge celebration for him. A huge party! A party. He played all the fanciest music. He ate all the fanciest food. And they put the fanciest outfits on. And they celebrated. Mm -hmm. Because the dad said, you know what? My son was lost, but now he, he is, is found. He's found. That's right. And that's kind of like what Jesus does. You see, we make a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. And Jesus actually died and sacrificed his whole life for our yeah. mistakes. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a consequence is is not is not there. And in fact, mm -hmm. what he gives us is grace, grace yeah, and grace. Love. love. And so all we have to do is ask for forgiveness yes. and tell the Lord that we're going to do better. Yeah. We're going to work hard. I'm going to try harder next time. And we're going to try harder next time. And no matter how bad or how terrible the mistake is, he always offers us with open arms, forgiveness and love and grace. So my friends, I wanna thank you for listening to us today. Listen, thanks for sharing our story. And also know that your father loves you 
and he made you perfect in, his, in every way and he will forever offer you grace and love. And the, for that, we are all super thankful. All right, let's say a quick prayer, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, dear God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness for your sins. And we know we do bad things, but you still call us your kids. And we thank you for your love, and we thank you for being you. We love you, and we look forward to coming to your house one day. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Bye, friends. Bye, friends. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Today's reading comes from Mark 3, 20-35. Jesus went back home, and once again such a large crowd gathered that there was no chance even to eat. When Jesus' family heard what he was doing, they thought he was crazy and went to get him under control. Some teachers of the law of Moses came from Jerusalem and said, This man is under the power of Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. He is even forcing out demons with the help of Beelzebul. Jesus told the people to gather around him. Then he spoke to them in riddles and said, how can Satan force himself out? A nation whose people fight each other won't last very long, and a family that fights won't last long either. So if Satan fights against himself, that will be the end of him. How can anyone break into the house of a strong man and steal his things unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can take everything. I promise you that any of the sinful things you say or do can be forgiven, no matter how terrible those things are. But if you speak against the Holy Spirit, you can never be forgiven. That sin will be held against you forever. Jesus said this because the people were saying that he had an evil spirit in him. Jesus' mother and brothers came and stood outside. Then they sent someone with a message for him to come out to them. The crowd that was sitting around Jesus told him, Your mother and brothers and sisters are outside and want to see you. Jesus asked, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he looked at the people sitting around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who obeys God is my brother or sister or mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have a friend of mine that describes a, a practice that was regular in his family. They would get up, the kids would get ready for church at the, um, let's say the, invitation of the parents, and then something would break out on the way to church, and there would be um, some Christian fellowship. It, sometimes it grew very intense. And then they would, when they got in the parking lot, they would uh, suddenly remember that they were just 15, 20 seconds away from walking into the family of God, 
and all of a sudden everything would be resolved with smiling faces. Um, so good to see you. Yes, we are all doing well. Everything is great in the family. That's a good lead in for this story. If you have a family, you have a built in system of conflict. I, what I love about this story is it connects Jesus to us in a way that we can all relate to. Uh, to uh, have a family is to have parents who have expectations of a child uh, after an investment that has been poured into them. Uh, sometimes, sometimes parents have been known to have a preferred pathway for their child. And, and sometimes uh, children, as they are growing into their own, have a, a pathway, a, an idea of something that would be different. And every once in a while, there's conflict about that, just like we see here in this story with Jesus. One of the, the things that bubbles to the surface is the, the reflection that parent and child uh, often uh, often find themselves on, on different pathways. And sometimes we as parents, those of us that are parents, we forget that the, the child's pathway is God-given, just as is calling and vocation. These are all at God's initiative and God's direction. And so parents, we live in a great trust that we ultimately will give the child back to God, remembering that the child is always God's before the child is ever ours. We hold this great trust that God gives that uh, we will raise the child and model love to the child and then let the child go. Uh, but as this story reveals, helicopter parenting is not just a 21st century reality. It was present all the way back in the time of Jesus. Now, let me dig into the story. Uh, Jesus was in Capernaum. Capernaum is 20 miles from his hometown of Nazareth, which was to the north. Uh, one of the, the reflections that we see in Mark chapter 3, if we take the, the whole chapter collectively together, is this is the early part of Jesus' ministry where we get a picture of what the early phase of that looks like. And Mark tells us plainly, there are tremendous crowds. If we look at verses seven to nine, a little bit before this story, we see that the scope of Jesus teaching and healing, um, his reputation goes all the way to Tyre and Sidon on the coast, all the way up to Judea in the north, Jerusalem in the south, and across the Jordan River into Jordan on the, on the east. What we find is that his reach goes at least 50 miles in every direction. So while Nazareth may be a full day's walk uh, from, from Jesus, it is a short day's gossip. You know how it is, how word spreads. Quickly, uh, we find that Jesus' parents uh, decide all of all the things that they have heard about Jesus, uh, their son, they need to go and stage an intervention. That's really what this story is about. It's about an intervention. And it's ultimately, it's ultimately about what Jesus teaches about what makes for family in the kingdom of God, what, who get to call themselves family, and what do they do? And doing is a critical component uh, to f belonging to the family. So what's interesting to me is uh, as the story begins to unfold, the parents make uh, in, in family, so we can imagine, you know, some of the other siblings there, but they make the, the trip uh, a good full day's walk from Nazareth to Capernaum, where Jesus is teaching inside a house, 
We're told that the setting is so crowded that Jesus couldn't even, when he gets back from the other side of the lake, he didn't even have time, time to eat. But when his parents get there, um, they've heard about his reputation now. So let's unpack that a little bit. Jesus had been exercising demons. Jesus had been associating with people on the wrong side of the lake, or we might say on the wrong side of the tracks. The east side of the, the lake was the Decapolis. It was a Greek speaking region. And Jesus already had um, embraced people on all sides of the lake. Uh, Jesus um, was teaching and disturbing the synag both synagogue practice, custom, and Sabbath understanding and law. He was redefining it, but it was enough that it was uh, a it made for a critical a critique of Jesus that no doubt made its way to his parents. And so what do parents do? They come down and they ask somebody else to go inside. They triangulate someone else who is not identified to go in and tell Jesus to come on out. Um, uh, one of the things I think we never lose as parents is the right to parent still. But it's fascinating the, the dialogue that takes place inside, there is a, a previous um, encounter with the Pharisees and the scribes where they do not dispute Jesus' power. They just dispute where it comes from. They simplify it to the point where they, they know that his power has to come from either from God or the devil, and they're just sure that it couldn't be from God. Well, as Jesus um, is called out by his parents, he responds in a way really that uh, leads us as disciples to reflect, to relearn, to embrace all that it means to be a part of God's family. It's redefined in a way that forever frees us and challenges us uh, to what it means to be family. So doing the will of God, let me uh, propose, involves at least three significant moves that I think um, characterize our doing and not just our saying. So one of the, the things that we first should understand is that being a part of the family involves not just quiet belief, not just um, uh, private uh private words or private reflections, but it involves more than what we say, ultimately landing in the place of what we do. So disciples do a lot of things that uh, lead us to understand Jesus' own life and his love. Let me propose that disciples do dependency dependency. It's what we see most plainly in Jesus' life that characterizes all of his moves. The night before he called his disciples, which is the story that precedes this one, he spent the night away praying through the night about who God would call. I, I can just imagine in that large crowd that he had spent some time, most people estimate, up to a year with Jesus, hearing his teaching already, that uh, Jesus had an idea of who he would call, who seemed to pay attention best. And instead, instead, he calls the 12 at God's lead. That's the way it always is with disciples. We do not plan or presuppose um, we learn to depend on God for guidance and providence. In fact, what the disciple ultimately does is invite God to be present with them always, and presence leads to providence. When God is present with us in our every day, when we, sur when we surrender the first part of our day to, to prayer and guidance, that God's presence with us 
gives us strength and carries us through, leads us in right understanding of God's preferred future and God's will. Uh, so we do dependency. We practice faith. We practice trusting in God to be enough no matter the situation. And we model that for uh, those around us within our family and without. Even by the words we say, uh, we might wake up saying tomorrow, I don't know exactly how I'm going to make it through, but I know God has got this and God has got me and all will be well. And uh, all manner of things, as Julian Norwich of Norwich said, all manner of things will be well because God's got us. Maybe you need to hear that, that God has got you. Let me also um, remind us that dependency means that um, we no longer just plan for tomorrow ourselves, which is absolutely our nature to do as individuals, as families, as a community of faith. Uh, we're famous for setting down all of our plans and submitting them to God. But dependency works it the other way around, where we start out by saying, God, what are your plans? And lead me to be a part of what you're doing in the world today. May we practice dependency as a part of the family. Disciples also do reconciliation. Now, I know what you're thinking. Do reconciliation. Dependency was tough enough, John. What do you mean? Um, let me simplify it in, in, in the most, um, I, I pray, easy to understand words. Disciples do reconciliation by making the first move. We make the first move in broken relationships. Whether it's our fault or whether it's not, whether an act of justice um, has been misrepresented or perpetrated against us, whether someone has hurt us, gossiped, slandered about us, broken off the relationship, or whether it's a, our own responsibility, that is not the important factor. Doing reconciliation means quite simply that we make the first move. It's a move that disciples always make. It's tempting. It's really tempting in our world to say things like, well, I'm never going to because of what that person did to me. But disciples, what they continue to do, they, the first move is we take the person to God in prayer. Oh, Lord, help me in my understanding or in my relationship or in my struggle or in my pain with this person. The first move toward reconciliation is we take that person to God over and over and over again. That is what we see that God has done for us. Here's the, the reason for reconciliation. Because at just the right time, while we were yet sinners, God sent his son to forgive us of our sins and that proves God's love toward us. Because God has made the first move to be reconciled to us, we are ever mimicking and modeling that move in our life for ourselves and for everyone else. There's no more powerful witness of who Jesus is and what his love looks like than when we mimic the move to reconcile the world to God in Jesus Christ. And that is lived out in the relationships that are so precious to us. Let me also submit that the move to reconcile holds the power, the greatest power for transformation. So if you want to be a part of the family, you commit to making the first move always. We never wait around for someone else to do that. 
Last but not least, disciples do love. Love is such a, a ubiquitous word that's used in so many ways that we so often don't really understand what's being said. But the, the love that Jesus came to model for us is agape. It's the love that is given to us by God first, the kind that is without string or attachment. It is the kind that is selfless and sacrificial and that reflects a servant's heart. It is the love, the kind of love that we've always wanted, the kind that most deeply touches our hearts and the kind of love again, that witnesses to the world that Jesus is so different. You know, this week we've seen a, a lot, the last two weeks in our country. When I think about these three moves that disciples make, I'm, I'm reminded of a video that I saw um, as protesters were storming as rioters uh, domestic terrorists were storming the Capitol. In the midst of that, may, if you watched closely, you probably saw a, a large sign with words. It was a huge banner, probably 15 feet tall. In the largest words, it said, Jesus saves, as people were committing acts of violence against police officers and other individuals. Jesus saves, what kind of messaging is that? Is that the message that the church has for the world? That Jesus saves as we commit acts of violence? Then inside, if you saw the, there was a 12 minute video, if you saw that uh, that was released over the weekend, one of the most disturbing parts of that video to me personally was watching those who broke into the Senate floor uh, in the midst of, of um, their response. It was in a, a couple of moments that their leader sitting um, on the very desk where the vice president sat, took off his helmet because he was garbed in differing attire with face paint and with a helmet with horns then said, come on, everybody, let's pray. And then he proceeded to pray and to be thankful to Jesus for the power to overthrow. I'm reminded, quite honestly, in that moment of the misunderstanding that disciples had about Jesus as he lived his life and made his way to the cross what we actually saw was much akin to what the disciples most deeply hoped for. The kind of revolution that would bring down governments all around them. The kind of revolution that would exalt them in power and lift them up. Even James and John, they fought about who would be the greatest on the way to the Last Supper. What we see in Jesus, though, is that to be a part of the family, we commit to doing the things that Jesus did. That words that are invoked in prayer and that signs that are put before all the people do not tell the story of the ways that God loves the world. No, you do that and I do that not by what we just believe privately or say publicly, but by what we do. Discipleship involves doing. And friends, doing is always, always at the heart of being God's family. Our world desperately needs to see us as Christians do this and more that our witness, the witness of the church, might be restored, that God would be glorified, that hearts would be changed, moved on seeing what Christians do. May our doing 
lead up and line up with all of our speaking. One of the closing quotes from the speech at Inauguration Wednesday by the president was that um, we should not as a people um, lead by the example of power, but rather um, we should lead by the power of our example. Let me just say this last word. That's a great word for disciples. May you and I lead by the power of our example to the glory of God. Would you pray with me? God, we pray that our doing would match our talking, that our doing for you would mimic the deepest held beliefs in our heart. And when we struggle to do what we ought to do, we pray for your Holy Spirit to correct and change, rebuke and challenge us to do things anew, maybe sometimes things we've never ever done. We pray this for your witness, which is needed in the world now more than ever. We do pray for those who serve in our land, just as we always pray for those who have transitioned on. We pray for you to heal this land. Heal this land, O oh Lord, not only of division, but of the, the messaging that does not reflect your love for this world. And lead us, O oh Lord, that it would begin with us. We pray to bring you joy in all of our witness and in all of our doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a great week. Know that you are beloved of God, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Dear God, I've been trying all the hard But it seems the harder that I try, oh, the harder it becomes. And I feel like giving up most of the time. I'm not scared of imperfections, 
for the questions in your head. Just know that you have always been enough. Cause you tried and tried, and I saw you wrestle with every how, every why. I was right there listening. So just fall into the mystery, and I'll meet you here in the melody to try. Have a great week, church. This is just the kind of week where you can do new things. Remember to do dependency. Go ahead, start today. Make a, a practice of prayer. The first thing you do, maybe write down some notes as you do about what you hear God saying to you. That will help you to do new things. Go ahead and do reconciliation. There's somebody this week that God would have you reach out and make the first move to. So go ahead and do it. And go ahead and do love. Do love to those around you and to strangers. And you will bring Christ's presence to them in ways that bring God joy. You are beloved in Jesus Christ now and always. Have a great week. God bless you.